So we get our second little Riley and Lucas maneuver moment here with her trying to uh, learn how to build set pieces and Dave is trying to teach her how to use the staple gun and she's like not getting it because she's being too gentle with it. So Lucas walks over to help and he shows her how to use the staple gun by like putting his hand on hers and being like, you need to apply a little more Mm. pressure. And Dave, of course, is like, that's right. He doesn't notice any of this. He's just like, yay, good. Riley learned how to use the staple gun. Um, But what I think is kind of ironic and funny about this scene in aside from the fact that like Issa comes in again and interrupts them um, is there's this kind of this irony of like in this episode, Lucas teaching Riley to be more assertive and like, Mm. you know, put a little more pressure and like that kind of thing, which like in the context of construction makes sense. But in reality, it's like by the time they have their more established relationship dynamic, like Riley is for sure, for sure. Like the more, assertive kind of dominant personality so i think it's almost like a little bit of a like a red herring of like Mm. oh that's what their relationship's gonna be like too but it's like no it's like the exact opposite (laughs) yeah it's quite interesting because it's also showing her the side of him that he never like he doesn't really show except when he is working and it's usually very professional but then with her it's not which is just it's a weird kind of juxtaposition because it's such like a strong kind of all business side with the techies and the performers but then with Riley it's like hmm maybe that's just Riley brain being like (laughs) yeah I mean it's definitely a little bit of that that's for sure so yeah Issa interrupts again I have in my notes just that like I'm sorry to say but Issa's kind of a mood As, as an asexual I'm like I understand what can I say (laughs) <laughs> then we get into Jack and Eric are like still on their little hunts. And I just, the only reason I want to talk about this scene is because I love Harley's line where he says, I, Janitor Harley Kiner, am a man of many interests. I am not simply limited to the sanatorial arts. <laughs> um, I love the sanatorial arts. I would love to know what encompasses the sanatorial arts. <laughs> but I think that's just a great, like, I think that's his only line in the first season. Like he doesn't have any other lines, but I love that he's just like such a staple of Adams now and like later in the show so it's fun that he has his moment here <laughs> wow I yeah I never really realized that that's his only line that just seems crazy because he he seems so important yeah I, I think it is we'll see in the next you know three or four episodes if I was wrong but I'm pretty sure that's his only line in season one I will say I wrote this later but the one thing about this episode writing wise that I think is maybe like not it's not, I don't think it's noticeable to, like, other people, but it's noticeable to me, um, is I think the pacing of this episode is, like, a little bit weird, because when I write episodes now, like, I'm very conscious of, like, and this is partially because there's so many fucking characters now, but I'm very conscious of, like, the passage of time in an episode, Mm -hmm. and, like, I don't necessarily like to have, I try to, like, to, like, jump between different characters or different locations in a way where it, like, you wouldn't have necessarily say, and nobody go and check episodes to see if this is true, because I I can't confirm it's always like this. But I don't, like, if I have a scene with Farkle at, you know, USC or whatever, then I'm not going to want to have another scene with him for another two or three sets, unless it's an immediately after that scene, because mm-hmm. I think it's weird to jump, like, two hours with the same character. Um, I try mm-hmm. to really avoid that and mix it up, so we're kind of constantly getting a little bit of every person. Whereas right. in this episode, I was just noticing, like, it'll just, like, jump to, like, the same people, like, later. And I'm like, oh, okay, time is fast. I got it. Yeah. But I think, like, reading it now, I'm like, I would not have done it that way. <laughs> I agree. You definitely have – that's definitely something that happens a bit more in season one, like, with the pacing. Mm-hmm. It is notable, actually, now that you mention it. Yes. So sorry if I've now mentioned it everyone's was going to notice it. But – it um, it was just noticeable to me because I I think that is something that if, if someday if we ever want to talk about just like the the writing process of the show, but one of the things that when we build the outlines, um, that is so the biggest brain drain I think of the process is time and trying to figure out like especially with time zones. Don't get me fucking started on the time zones, but like okay, if this amount of time is passing and we want to flow through this amount of time, like how should I move between these characters? What order should these scenes be in? Particularly if I want things to like 
connect a theme between two scenes, you know? Like, there's so much that goes into the arranging of an episode now that, like, arranging is, like, its own stage in our writing process of, like, putting all of these scenes in order, um, which clearly just was not really necessary back here because there was, like, we had our one storyline and it was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> We're going to finish the storyline. So it's just interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that. It, it jumps around in these scenes with all the kids, like, so willy-nilly. It's kind of just, we're going wherever we want to go, and that's fine. Um, right now, we have made it back with the performers and the techies, and they're all, like, doing a little costuming assignment where they have to make the costumes for the techies. So they're getting measurements, you know, they're discussing looks. Zay and Riley have been assigned to work with Lucas, and to me, I think that is so funny because I'm, like, the idea of Zay having to costume Lucas mm-hmm. is, like, insane. Like, you know, if that happened today, it would be like, no, I can't do this. <laughs> I cannot work with him. Get him away from me. Um, so it's good that they have Riley there to be a buffer. And, of course, there's the beautiful little detail of the fact that even though Lucas doesn't want to do the assignment and doesn't want to talk to them, he is letting Riley get all the measurements and, like, you know, touch all over him. So mm-hmm. noted. But he does uh, hiss at Zay, which I, you know, I love this line. It's, he reverts back to the Sean dubbed feral cat state and hisses at him, but you know, in brooding human form. It's so, yeah. I would like, I want to know like, what was, what is the equivalent of a hiss? (laughs) At the same time, we have uh, the pair here, I guess trio, Farkle and Maya have been assigned to work with Issa. And I think that this is just Again, we were talking about little foreshadowing things. This kind of foreshadowing grouping of Della Markle. You know, we know where this is going to go. So I think it's fun to see them in this state, even this early on. Um, Even though it's not really... It's really more of a Maya and Issa scene. And, like, Farkle's just in the background, like, being feral. (laughs) Um, But um, I love, speaking again of Maya and her humanity, there's a little moment here of, like, she's doing the measurements for Issa and it you know, we take care to know, like, she's taking it seriously and is, like, looking for signals of, like, hey, is it cool if I touch you here? Like, she did not have to do that. And we know for a fact that she can be, uh, like, very domineering and very just, like, mm. get out of my way or, like, I'm going to do what I want. But she is not like that with Issa here. And I think that that's really cool and just, again, shows the humanity inside of her. Yeah, she. it's the humanity, it's the respect, and I think it really lays that foundation for later when they become friends. Because yes. Issa knows, like, this is not actually, like, a bad person. Mm-hmm. This is someone who is trustworthy right. and respectful. Exactly. Um, I love the line that Farkle has where he says about Lucas, it's like he's sweating mediocrity. Um, he's it's a good line. He's he's just a little. He's so mean, I don't though. <laughs> I don't even have the words. Like he is a mess. Um, but that's we know where that's going to take him. So that's okay. Um, and I also it love the exchange. Seems, yeah, go ahead. It almost seems like something that like um, like his sister like said about him or something <laughs> in jest, and he's like reappropriating it. Yeah, that's funny. That's so true. That he could have totally picked it up from like one of his siblings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I love this exchange between Maya and Farkle where she says it's costuming Farkle, not brain surgery. And he says brain surgery would hurt less. It's funny because he's so flamboyant. He's so like he's so extra. And like a lot of the time with people in the arts, especially at that manifest and like this really like flamboyant dress sense or like this kind of, you know, fashion style. Mm-hmm. throwing together outfits and with Farkle it just like doesn't really like he's yeah. just he's not good at dressing even though yeah, he's I mean the blazer yeah. you know that's kind of like his signature season one thing and it's awful and everybody hates it um but yeah then I mean even in season three like he's very much like a banana republic little model you know like with his yeah. sweaters and his he's very yeah he's very low-key actually in terms of fashion do you think that the Minkai have a tailor, like a personal tailor? I think they must. They Oh, totally. Yeah, especially since Farkle, or since, you know, Stuart is so wealthy and, like, it goes yeah. to so many important meetings and stuff like that. Like, I'm sure they must have a family tailor because 
And, you know, Jennifer goes with him to things, you know, like, surely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have a personal everything. They have a personal trainer. They have a personal chef. Like, we've met so many of their employees. (laughs) (laughs) It's actually crazy to think about how rich they are. That's, like, insane. Once you start thinking about it, it's, like, I remember one time when I was Googling, like, penthouses in the financial district, which is, like, where they would live. Mm Mm-hmm and how expensive they were and just how nice these places are that are just above the clouds in New York. Yeah. And it's funny too, because I feel like, you know, even in the show, like Charlie and Fark will get compared a lot for both being like wealthy white boys. But even then the disparity between Charlie and Farkle is like mm. insane. Like Charlie is rich. Yes. But like, they're like, you know, conservative upper middle class family rich where it's like, you know they're conservatives i mean like they save their money they you know have inheritances i'm sure all that kind of stuff but like charlie's like the you know the one percent and then farkle is like the oh oh one percent like he is even richer (laughs) it's kind of crazy like they're not actually compatible at all (laughs) yeah it's like if that's your if that's your closest kind of like peer (laughs) it's not even in the same stratosphere (laughs) I also wonder, too, after Issa gets the Val money, if she's, like, mm-hmm. richer than Charlie or richer than the gardener. She must be. Yeah, definitely. Because I feel like the, the gardeners are, like, to the point where they, like, have all the money they need. They have a little extra for nice things, nice holidays, whatever. They never have to go, like, worrying about, like, what they're spending. Mm-hmm. I mean, Charlie like, did take a family expenses paid, like, five month journey it's wherever he wanted to go like they clearly have money to burn but yeah, but it's not like there's just like masses of excess right I feel like Issa's like she's got like a bit especially just because it's her just by herself as well mm-hmm. so it's not like seven people to look after with this money it's like right it might be more. we're gonna have to do a uh financial ambition financials <laughs> like yeah. examinatory episode <laughs> um yeah so then we're still talking about this project that they're going to put together and Lucas continues to be unhelpful because he's sitting there thinking about Riley but not thinking about Riley because why would he think about Riley and (laughs) Issa's like where's your fucking brain this week and he doesn't know because Riley took it and she won't give it back (laughs) um then Lucas is being like grumpy about it because he's dramatic and a little grumpy diva and Dylan and Asher like are kind of like oh Mm. Mm. and we just put that in our back pockets for later so here's this is the perfect example of the weird like timing jumping around is like we had that scene with Issa and Farkle and Maya and then we go to the scene with Issa and Lucas yeah it's like Issa just moved (laughs) and then we have this scene with Lucas and Farkle and it's like what (laughs) why is time passing when is this happening Um, how is how are they all in all these places at once (laughs) it's a bit it's a bit weird. Um, but yeah, so it moves into the scene with Lucas and Farkle where he's being like, they're both, you know, not having great weeks and they're not in the best moods and they take that out on each other. Um, and I love, I just, I do love Farkle like being scrappy and insane and being like, I am not going to do it anymore. Make me do it. Um, <laughs> and just being totally shut down. But I remembered that I was going to say something about this, which is you talked about this idea of like, this episode is kind of like, you know, a setup for, like, where things are going and the A-class as a group and, like, this is what it could be. And I think it is metaphorically and symbolically interesting that the two people who can't get their heads around this and can't get their shit together, for the most part, and really struggle with it and are in lower places than everyone else in this episode are Lucas and Farkle. And then Mm. in season two, who are the people that kind of are self-destructing and destroying everything. Lucas and Farkle. So this is like a little bit of a a headwind for that coming up. I love it. So yeah, they're mean to each other. It's very rude. Then this, again, another moment, but at least this one makes sense, where like Sean comes in to be like, Lucas, I have to talk to you. And then we go to the scene with Lucas and Sean and Angela. Um, Lucas is in like five scenes in a row. But yeah, him. they're basically, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. Um, but so they're like, you, we have been told by someone that you are not participating and you're not helping this assignment. 
And he's like, um, you can't make me do this. And they're like, yes, we can. We're your teacher. <laughs> you have to do this assignment. And Lucas throws a little tantrum and knocks Sean's papers to the ground and leaves. And that's when I wrote <laughs> in my notes that he's such a little diva <laughs> because he is such a diva. But again, to that same point, in his defense, not that I need to defend him, but in his defense, he really has not really learned how to handle stressful situations in a healthy way, given his parents. <laughs> Even so, he's a diva and it's silly. But yeah, one could argue that the definition of diva is people who haven't learned how to handle stressful situations in a healthy sociable way mm. it's exactly what Lucas is and you know he'll get there he will <laughs> he will he will mellow with time it is true um, but I do love how Sean like kind of contextualizes his behavior and stands up for him as well like that he, first of all, was like, uh, Farkle does, like, the same shit half the time. He's just louder about it and doesn't throw paper, but he does the same things. Yeah. And I, and that he also talks about, how, like, listen, like, I used to have moments like this. I get it. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, take care of what I need to take care of, but I'm also gonna give him space. Like, I like that Sean, Sean is a bad teacher, we know this, but I like that he, he's a bad teacher, but he's not a bad like kind of support figure yeah. in the techies lives and i think that this is one of a good example of that of him being like i get lucas like i don't agree with his behavior but i get where he's coming from yeah i guess it comes from that like you know he kind of messed up and he needed this job and he got mm -hmm. it because people supported him and like gave him the opportunity and he's kind of learned from that and he is he is able to sort of give that to lucas which we see time and time again um, yes so that is that exactly uh then they have a nice little song they talk about like angela maybe auditioning for stuff again and then they have this song over and over again um it's, it's cute but it's like why like yeah it's cute it's fine it's four seasons later do i care no um but it was you know in the moment it's fine it's nice it's good for they them were easy, they were an easy way to have an extra song in season one for sure yes that's true and now it's like we have too many songs. So it's like I can't afford to be throwing random songs out there. Um, yeah. So there's that. So then, okay, so this scene, the scene that we have here, Charlie and Zay are trying to help Farkle with the assignment because, again, he is struggling and their whole job is to, like, help people this week and be like, you can do it. It's okay. Um, this scene, I just, we need to talk about two things. We need to talk about Zay and Charlie, but we also need to talk about Zay and Farkle. We need to talk mm -hmm. about Zarkle because I think, I think we talked about this a little bit before and we will definitely talk about it in the future. Um, Zay and Farkle, one of my favorite dynamics, I think that they are so interesting in their friendship and kind of like, I mean, here they're like not really friends yet, but like yeah. they deal with each other. Um, but I think that this moment here where it's like, Zay has to step in and be like, hey, like, cut it the fuck out. Like, we're just trying to help you. And I'm, don't talk to us that way. The fact that Zay stepping in to be like, hey, stop, is what makes Sparkle be like, oh, I'm sorry, is mm -hmm. like, I just think they have such an interesting dynamic where it's so clear that Farkle, he would not admit it now, but it's so clear that, like, he kind of idolizes Zay or, like, just really respects him and admires him even if it, he hates the fact that he respects and admires him. And so he takes his opinion really seriously. And so the fact that he, like, jumps in and is like, hey, cut the cut the shit out, is like, Farkle then backs off. And is like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. the, fact that, the fact that Zay can get Farkle Mingus to say sorry is like, it just needs to be said. Like, okay. Yeah, I guess because wow. Zay is like, he's a big competition and he also, he stays out of it so much of the time. It's almost like, Michael's like, oh, well, if Zay is calling me out, I can't, like, lose his good opinion. And I can't, I've clearly gone, like, too far this time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the reason he jumped in is because of yeah. Charlie. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, just the fact of, like, another example of Charlie being a teacher you know, very naturally, the fact that he is the one who's really trying to work on this with Farkle and, like, be like, yeah. you can do it. Like, we're just going to figure it out. It's going to be okay. And Farkle being like, Rawr. 
um, is like one thing. But this idea of like Charlie letting people rag on him and rag on him and rag on him and not ever saying anything. And then this is the first moment ever that Zay jumps in and is like, hey, don't let people, like, no, don't talk to him like that. I think that that was such a like crazy moment for Charlie. Mm -hmm. Like he just, he would not even expect, he was not waiting for someone to do that. He was not expecting that to happen. He was just going to keep letting Farkle like verbally abuse him. Yeah. And then Zay said, fuck that. And jumped right in and like changed the game. And I think you can see like both Farkle and Charlie are like stunned. Like they're like, whoa, like what just happened? Like Charlie is so stunned that he doesn't even react to say taking his arm and dragging Mm -hmm. him out of the room. (laughs) And not not just out of the room. Into the costume loft. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Of all the like, first of all, say, why do you take him there? (laughs) Like of all the places, but it's like, wow. What a moment. I mean, that's a big moment. It's a very it's a good it's a big pattern for Zay and Charlie in defending themselves and mm-hmm. being up for themselves and what they want and what they need and making each other better as people and stronger. Um mm-hmm. and so definitely just I, I wouldn't even say part one because I'd say episode three is the start of that, but Yeah. This is like the big part of that. And early Yeah, I mean it is You're right, because this is kind of, I think there's a lot of things about this next part where they go to the costume loft that's like, again, just kind of these setups of these recurring things like, A, the costume loft itself is a setup Mm -hmm. because that's going to become such an important location for them. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, like, just the fact that, like, they, they, everybody in this class knows what the reputation of the costume loft is, but the, it's like, I don't think, obviously, Zay was thinking about that when he dragged him there. It was just like, we need to go somewhere else. But, yeah. like, the fact that in that moment, neither of them are thinking about that, but it's going to come to mean something else is, like, that's kind of that foreshadowing. Yeah. The universe like- is hanging over us and we don't realize it in this moment. Um, yeah. Ooh. And then just, yeah, the thing about Zay being, like, you let people talk to you like that you should you should no one should talk to you that way like no no one should be able to talk to you that way you should not let people talk to you about that that way and then he has this line where he says you're way too good to let people step on you like that that's kind of the last sentiment and that's kind of i highlighted that in purple because that's kind of a series theme for the relationships Mm -hmm. in this show because i think you could parallel that line to lucas's season one episode 11 uh, you're too damn talented to be letting people like push you around mm-hmm. or like stepping aside because someone else wants what you want. Um, that's like kind of their kind of sister sentiments there. Um, but yeah, I just I think the Zay Zay reinforcing that Charlie is worth it and that Charlie is as good as them and deserves respect and deserves more than he accepts is so 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 quintessential to their relationship hell yeah and then just the fact that charlie is like what (laughs) yeah it's kind of sad i mean we talked about this a little bit in a previous episode i can't remember what episode but just this idea of like charlie i guess like i i'm trying to remember what this the context was but like him just accepting that like people treat him a certain way and like that he never argues back against that I can't remember what it was. I'll have to, like, look into it. But I think he just is so in default of, like... Oh, 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 I'm remembering. I'm remembering. It was that... It was episode 104, and it was when, after the Maya, uh, meanwhile, Mr. Grinch thing, Mm -hmm. um, and Riley went up to Charlie and was like, hey, like, I don't think you deserved that. Like, I was really mean of Maya to do that. And he was like, oh, it's it's fine. It's okay. Like, he accepts Mm -hmm. the bare minimum from people, even lower than the bare minimum, and he just brushes it off. Like, no, it's fine. Like, it's I'm okay. And it's like, like, that exactly is what Zay is combating here. It's like, no, actually, it's not fucking okay. Like, you do not have to put up with that. Yeah, on Jose and Riley realness. Let's go. I so true. My trio. My trio. Trio for the ages. But yeah, and then it even says here, you know, 
Charlie sa- it says, whatever he's starting to feel here, it is definitely deeper than he thought. Ooh. Maybe he doesn't want to just be his friend really bad. Maybe there is something there. And Zay's just like, mm, Farkle. And Charlie's like, <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Oh boy. So um, then we have Lucas going around and... I mean, yeah, <laughs> wow. he's going around interrogating everybody, kind of a little bit of maybe a um, setup for 312 Lucas mm-hmm. interrogating everybody montage. But so he figures out who ratted him out to Sean and Angela, and he invites them to come have a hangout in the booth with him and just chill. And Dylan and mm-hmm. Asher fall for it because... <laughs> They're angels, and they're like, okay, we're going to hang out with our bestie. And then he basically corners them and is like, I know you fucking did this. Why'd you fucking do this? I Here's the receipts. I know it was you. And Asher breaks first and is like, okay, fuck, fine, we did it. And then he has this line where he's like, he's onto us. He knows. Look, you can see it on his beautiful withholding face. And I think <laughs> the way I imagine Lucas reacting to that of like, uh, is like... <laughs> Like, does I, he has to know that Lucas and Dylan, or Lucas has to know that Asher and Dylan both think he's like hot, right? Like, he has to know yeah. that. They, at have, some... they probably tell him all the time. That's like the <laughs> only thing holding his self esteem together is like, okay, I'm not like, like, I, he's like, I'm repulsive. And Dylan is always just like, so beautiful, man. He's like, okay, that's going to keep me going for like five more minutes because <laughs> Dylan seems genuine in that he likes the appearance of my corporeal form. <laughs> well, I think, too, like, I mean, the Dylan of it, too, is, like, obviously in this season, you know, this early on, like, they're, like, and even later, I mean, they're always, like, even though they become very, you know, settled in Dylan and Asher, and it's, like, they're clearly not gonna, you know, stray, but, like, they were always, like, oh, yeah, Lucas is, like, unfairly beautiful and, like, unfairly hot and we hate him for it, but we love him for it. Um, mm. but what I love about Dylan, how his kind of shifts is like he, in season three, he, with Lucas, his affection becomes very like, he has multiple lines in season three where he's like, you're so cute. Or he's like, I'm going to like pinch your little cheeks. Cause you're so adorable. And Lucas is like, <laughs> stop. Um, but I think that that's just like the shift there is like here. It's like, damn, he's so beautiful. I'm going to die. And then later it's like, you're so cute. You're so adorable. Look at you. Oh, you're so cute. So... They love him so much. It's so adorable. adorable. This is such a cute scene because it's almost like they're his, they're Lucas's children or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then but like it... other times it's like they're his parents. Yeah, and I love that <laughs> of all of them because you get that with all of, you get Asher and Lucas kind of. Oh my god, Dylan! Like you are being like a, a toddler, which they find somewhat endearing, but mm-hmm. somewhat not. And then you get yeah, Ash and Dylan as like this like couple parents that he sees <laughs> that Lucas sees as this like strong relationship and then you get yeah Lucas, Lucas and Dylan that. are like the okay Asher's on his shit again like yeah. okay well how are we gonna deal with this like they when they have that moment in um 308 when they're trying to convince Asher to like be in the performance because mm-hmm. they need a performer and he's like I'm not gonna do it I'm not gonna do it you can't make me do it so what are you gonna say to that and then they just kind of like look at each other <laughs> Like, like that's oh. kind of Dylan and Lucas's version is like, well, how are we gonna, how are we gonna wrangle Asher? Hundred <laughs> percent. So yeah, I think to that point too, this seeming really cute. It's also notable because this is like Dylan and Asher's kind of first actual scene. Like they've been in the last eight episodes, but this is their first like scene scene where they like actually are carrying the point of the scene and like are more fleshed out than just like we're here in the supermarket with Issa and Riley like it's it's very exciting like this kind of like little setup of like they're here and they're gonna be stars (laughs) yeah and they care about their Lucas baby yes yes and I loved uh this line that Dylan has um when he when they're like apologizing that's something I want to talk about too is the dynamic of the three of them and the way it evolves but like when they're apologizing and he's like if you're really mad at us, like, you can, it's fine, like, you can hate us, like, you can push us off the catwalk, and then Dylan says, just please let Asher wear a blindfold, he's scared of heights, me, you can just look me right in the eyes when you push me off, but I think that's, like, perfect Dylan Mm -hmm. dramatics, but the fact that he's, like, let Asher wear a blindfold before you kill him, please. (laughs) It's so extra, 
like you can see how Dylan could have been a performer and also like yes. acted well with his like almost Shakespearean you can see it on his beautiful withholding face like <laughs> you can't tell yes. me you're not going to the stage man yeah they are both all three of them so theatrical like truly the fact that they're like we would never perform like well Dylan's not like that because he was literally going to be a performer but like they're like oh the techies like we don't perform it's like they're all so theatrical it's ridiculous yeah. um but yeah I think this scene is really interesting I think because it, the way that Dylan and Asher react here where it's like oh no like Lucas is mad we're in trouble like oh my god he's so fucked up like this is so bad what can we do to make it up to him I think it kind of shows the like the beginning of this journey of kind of the power imbalance in their friendship where in season one Mm -hmm. and and presumably you know in freshman year like it's this friendship of like they're friends with lucas but it feels like oh we're friends with this cool person and like it's kind of conditional like we don't know if we're gonna fuck it up and we feel like we have to kind of like we we need to make lucas happy we have to do everything to like make him feel good about it and i think And it's and that and some of that is a little bit just like when your friendship is more surface level, you're much more concerned with like, what does this person think of me and like how can I endear them to me and stuff like that. Whereas season two, you know, their friendship has deepened and they've been friends now for three years, with varying levels of you know becoming closer. And I think that, of course, as we know, is like a turning point. But that becomes like the fact that if you compare this scene one oh eight with them being like. Yes, we and they were right to do what they did. Like they should not be the ones necessarily apologizing so much. If you compare that to what two oh seven, when it's the Lucas is blowing off all the college stuff and is like, "Fuck it, I don't care." And Asher's finally like, "Well, do you think that's a good idea?" And it erupts in one of my favorite scenes in the whole entire show. That scene of like them raising their voices at each other and like having the con- confrontation moment that's been building for so long in their friendship. Yeah. And that kind of being this turning point of the 207, 208, 209 arc for the three of them and their friendship. And then after that, it's much more a friendship of equals and a friendship of yeah. I respect you the way you respect me and I see you as someone on my level. You know, like I think in this episode and in this season, they're not there and it's still like we put Lucas above ourselves for whatever reason. But I just think it's so interesting to be at the beginning of that here and see, like, that they so idolize him and, like, put his opinion above everything else. Whereas by the time he gets to season two and he's starting to make these really bad decisions and they're kind of torn and, like, we've been trying to help him for so long. How do we handle that? It becomes, like, he's not an idol. He's just some guy. And, like, just, like, humanizing your friend. And, like, I just, I think the three of them and their dynamic is one of the most interesting subplots in the show. And it's just so so meaningful and intriguing to me so it's really cool to to see the beginning of it you know like yeah. here definitely because it speaks to the maturity that dylan and asha you know they almost don't have here it's like it's mm-hmm. almost like a, an innocence that you know lucas is an idiot but he kind of has this like <laughs> idea of the world whereas it's almost like dylan and asha kind of just living in this little bubble still whereas by 207 they have really grown and they mm-hmm. they're really like almost like different people which is it is true in a way because you know their characters are so much more fleshed out yeah. they actually have ideas of the world and these kind of more deep personalities yeah and then so does lucas but now it's like those all clash together mm-hmm. until they find the way to make them fit oh beautiful so good i love it um, I also think too that this scene is interesting with the three of them because this idea of them being like, oh my god, like you're gonna be so mad at us. It's okay, like be really mad at us. Like if you have to like shove us off the catwalk, that's fine. And like Lucas's reaction being like, I'm not mad, and like him actually just being concerned about like, do you really think that about me? Like do you really think mm-hmm. I'm gonna hold us back? Like I think it's really interesting because we know Lucas is so sensitive to like, am I? You know, because of Kenneth, it's like, am mm-hmm. I coming off? do do the people i love fear me and i think Mm. here the way they react it's it's theatrical but i think like i think one of the reasons that he becomes so concerned and is like well wait can we actually talk about like why did you think that is because he has this moment of like oh my like are they scared of me like do they really think i'm gonna do that to them it's like like, no i don't think they actually think that but like even just the joke of it is like hold on like wait 
yeah, like even if you can joke about him committing violence against people he needs and cares about, like it's like, oh no, that's yeah, something is wrong. Yeah. Whew. Everything Whew. is the it's the layers with this guy. He's an mm-hmm. onion. So yeah, then I also like this little line that Dylan has where he says, I actually happen to think with a little bit of practice, you could be quite the leading man. Um, first of all, <laughs> he's right. Um, but it's funny that like he says that and then Lucas is like, the fuck? <laughs> but yeah, I I love them. So then we have the scene where Riley comes in to talk to Farkle after Jade tries to fix it but cannot fix this bitch. Um, so for- Riley comes in and is like, hey, like, here, let me try and help you. And the Riley touch, you know, helps everything. So she's able to get him to talk about why he's so upset. And he opens up about, I, I highlighted in purple that he has, he kind of talks about, like, that he can't handle the situation because it feels out of control. And it's just escalating this cycle of, like, he feels out of control and then he can't handle it and then it escalates and it just is this big cycle and I think that that is all foreshadowing you know for his character in season two and you know like moving forward so I like that yeah he needs he he definitely I mean feeling out of control is actually just a form of feeling trapped in like the stream of life and definitely Mm -hmm. is one of the factors that like contributes to his completely derailed mental health in yes. season two, he doesn't know what to do he's flailing and this is definitely just like a mini version of that exactly and yeah gosh goodness riley can like <laughs> kind of come out of this one but yeah Woo. it's also like i mean even talking about foreshadowing from earlier episodes like the fact that he's saying control in mm. 107 mm-hmm. is both i mean it's both the bipolar halsey thing of it all but it's also just like that is his problem is is the control and the lack of control and he has a, a line i think it's 110 it's in that it's in that first like really good uh isa and farkle scene where they talk to each other and he's like the, with the line where she's like does this psychotic monologue have a point but like mm-hmm. his point in that monologue is like i i wanted to control things so badly that i was gonna like strangle it because i needed it i needed it to be in control and so i think like yeah, that's such a huge part of his his whole mental arc. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and it's so funny because we're really just in this little, like, Farkle can't so, like, you know, but it's actually this, it's mm-hmm. so tied into his whole character arc. Yeah. Um, it's like, doesn't matter how smart you are, doesn't matter how good you are at performing Farkle, like, you can't control some things, and that just is what tips him over the edge. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh. And also, I just love that the scene, I love by our little protagonists, you know, getting to have a scene mm-hmm. together. Um, obviously, in season one, Farkle wasn't really a protagonist yet, so it doesn't feel like that when you first read it. But I love it because I look back and yeah. I'm like, look at them. My yeah. besties. They really don't <laughs> have that many scenes together. Um, yeah. I mean, Farkle doesn't have like loads and loads of scenes in season one anyway. It's almost like he's just like this very, because he is like this main huge catalyst of like, Mm-hmm. Band of the season like drama it's so interesting you know what's, he's just in you know what's so interesting is we were talking about when we made our first episode and we talked about like the protagonist and you had that point of like i think charlie is the third protagonist mm. well now i'm thinking about it and it's like the pattern of like obviously riley you know season one first protagonist very clear she still is you know a season end of season one farkle sets off all this change and all this shit and then farkle becomes a very very focal character in season two mm-hmm. we go into and becomes a protagonist we go into the end of season two charlie sets all of this change off and causes mm-hmm. all this shit to change and then in season three that kind of is like charlie's season and he kind yeah. of like goes through his whole big arc and all of that so maybe it's like that's like the the three yeah. of them in their pattern that's their like scam <laughs> yeah. layout interesting and i kind of want to say to that, does that mean that Maya is the protagonist of season four? That's an interesting question. I think uh, I'll say in terms of what I know about season four right now, <laughs> um, I would say that, well, I'll say this. I think Maya, her protagonist, if we're speaking protagonist in the sense of this show, her protagonist moment will be season five. Mm. Very okay. definitively. 
Um, and when we get there, you'll understand why. Um, but I think, and, and, and also I will say it fits that same pattern. So that's ominous, Ooh. but it does. Um, but season four, I feel like it's really interesting because Not season really four, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. season four is like, and I feel this when I'm writing it right now too, where it really, it feels like much in the way that the characters are going through all of these transitions and change and finding their new rhythm. Like, the show feels like that too. Like I feel like season four is a very transitional season. And so in some ways I think, I feel like also because the ensemble is so big, it's like at this point, I don't know that it's like, there's a new protagonist in that same vein in the same way we were just discussing, but because I think everybody's carrying a little bit of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I think I would say to me, season four feels like, Issa and Lucas's season. Yeah. No, it's because they were my second and third. I was like, who created, like, Maya kind of created the most change, but I feel like Issa and Lucas are kind of going through the most change personally. So, mm-hmm. yay, fun. So, uh, we'll be uh, unpacking all that. Um. <laughs> One day, maybe when we're like 38. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um but that is that is so interesting i feel like that's one of the that's one of the if we could make an ad for our show i would put that little protagonist thing on there because i think that was just we just had a little epiphany mm. moment there it's kind of yeah, interesting i love it <laughs> so yeah um I mean, for, Issa... oh. <laughs> go ahead should we go to the next scene because yes that's what i was gonna do <laughs> <laughs> yeah so Issa gets a text from Val and it's like fuck that um but then is debating like oh am i gonna audition for the musical because the next episode mm-hmm. is a musical um well they're all musicals but you get the point so <laughs> then we get into this very quintessential scene um one of the famous ones i'd say it yes. uh, riley is going to help lucas with his dancing because now he's taking the assignment seriously because he's worried that the techies are gonna think he's an awful person so He's trying to learn the dance moves, but he can't dance because he's not a dancer. As he says multiple times in the show after this, he says, you know, I'm not a dancer. Um, But he's trying his best. And Riley comes and tries to, she volunteers to help him. And so they have, you know, a little bit of banter, a little bit of cuteness. Uh, Again, the kind of motif of like hands and that Mm -hmm. like equating to trust is yeah. so important here because you know she's like i can help you but you have to let me and that is in the taking of the hands to waltz together and lucas yeah. being the one to accept that and to put his hand in hers and it's yeah it's and just parallels for me like to the lighting booth earlier and it's mm-hmm. like we had like he was like letting her in in that sense to the space and like kind of not intentionally just moving in a little bit and then in this she's like he's sort of in more like her space but at the same time it's like he's kind of she already had that door open and he's kind of taking that step through the door yeah to, yeah oh, okay. yeah <sighs> so yeah i mean the scene so classic so mean. um what, <laughs> what? He's like, she's like, well done. Also, I'm going to pretend that you are an idiot as well. <laughs> yeah, when she says, I wrote in my notes when she just clocked him, when she says, we'll use the three count. You can count that high, right? Like, oh my God. Riley. <laughs> she's been hanging out with the performers too much because she's getting sassy. Um, yeah. But that's okay. Um, Lucas is not going to begrudge her that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just... The, the just look at me line is like, Ooh. I'm gonna die. Um, yeah. They're just so like, I don't, I can't even like articulate. It's like, you mm-hmm. know, what Lucas always, she said, you know, like he likes to be in the shadows and he mm-hmm. likes to be able to see everything, but not be seen himself and like likes to be protected and like not connect with people in this way but then it's like just look at me it's like to hold that eye contact with someone like that is seeing and being seen and for him to to do that and it's like you know it's like the 
the chin touch. It's just like I Hello. Ooh. Yeah. It's it's almost I mean, I'm just reading a lot into words that are just literal. He keeps looking at his feet, but he just needs to look at her and it's it's like that is just like kind of the whole show in a way because it's like if he just looks down mm-hmm. and he doesn't try and he kind of just stays in his little like hunched over cover box position mm-hmm. that's just he's just going to keep overthinking and have problems and then it's like he looks up and not only he sees her he looks at her but he can see like other things as well and it's just like it opens his whole world when he looks at her oh my heart maddie that was really fucking beautiful <laughs> that was like next level wow um no i think you're so right i mean if you think about it then too like in season, if you want to play on that theme, like season three, like when he's trying, he can't get his, you know, essays for school together and he can't figure out how to talk about himself without like, like he doesn't want to talk about himself, but then it's like, how does he do the assignment? He like looks at it the way Riley would look at it, you know, mm-hmm. just, you know, just look at her, like look to her to like, you know, I think, damn, that was yeah. really beautiful. That was groundbreaking. That was a great, yeah. Amazing. Maddie, you're a genius. This is what you're here for. This is why you're on this podcast this is why we're here (laughs) (laughs) and then it's just you know it's so cute that like they get comfortable with it and like he's like actually kind of dancing with her and you know there's that whole motif throughout the show where you know missy said missy she says you know like well uh he's like i don't dance and she's like well um that's not true because i've seen you dance with riley and then he's like well you're not riley and Mm -hmm. it's just that whole thing of like he does not dance but he will dance with her is like so special to my heart. (laughs) Yeah. And they're like, they're laughing like, "Eh." and it's, yeah, it's just that whole, it's, it's, it's me just reading into everything, but it's, it's just (laughs) that it's loosened him up. Like he is like alive because Riley has like awoken him. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, Issa the tears. comes the in. Tears. <laughs> you, you're interrupting them again. Why are you doing this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, Issa, you gotta love it. It's kind of funny because I think, like, obviously, obviously, we know there is not romance between Lucas and Issa. But I think, in a way, I think there is still a triangle between Lucas mm-hmm. and Issa and Riley in this season. Yes. Um, because it's just, you know, it kind of says, like, things are changing. And what does that mean for them? What does that mean for her? Issa, come, Riley coming in and then you're changing the equation, the shape of things. And I think that, to me, I'm like, this is how triangles should be in TV shows. Where yeah. it's not necessarily that two people are fighting over the same person romantically. But it's just when people enter your life and dynamics change and the situation that you're used to changes how do you deal with that you know like i think that that is so much more interesting than two people are fighting over the same guy or the same girl like it's, it's i'm just saying <laughs> for sure i love too that this moment is very kind of quintessential like isa like this thing of something's changing and it scares her what's going to change in the process like that's so isa like that's isa's whole struggle throughout like the whole show is trying and trying and trying to get comfortable with change because she's always facing it. So then Jack and Eric are at school working late to catch some bitches who are sending details about Issa. And we were talking about this idea of like, you know, Jack not being, Eric not being Jack's person yet, like the go-to person. I think this moment here where they're like, Eric says, at the risk of jinxing it, never before would I believe you and I would be working so together so effectively with such a clear goal. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, speaking about things of, like, this being a catalyst that's setting up all this later stuff, I think Eric and Jack working on this project together is setting us up for the growth of season two. It's like they're working on fixing their school together. Season three, it's like, it's like they're, this is the beginning little nugget of, I would not have believed this, but this is about to become my life. Yeah, like, this is so, it's like a little spark that's going to become a blaze later on it's mm-hmm. interesting because it's like their priorities tend to be rather divergent but they both care about students and it's it's interesting because their priorities they perceive them as being so divergent but actually 
they just haven't really like talked about it enough to realize. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They've they've been focused the same. Their methods are different. Yes. And they've been so focused on how they disagree that they're completely ignoring. It's like if that picture of like the iceberg where it's like you see the little bit on the top Mm -hmm. and there's all this stuff underneath. It's like Mm -hmm. their, their iceberg is like the top is the things they disagree on and that's all they can see. Mm. But if they just went under the surface, it's like so much mass of everything that they value and agree on and see and care about. There's so much more there that they just aren't looking at at that point. They exchange a look. So it's on, (laughs) you know. It's on. (laughs) So then we get to the most iconic performance ever, one might say. uh, The techie performance of Mm -hmm. Dancing Queen as performed by ABBA in the Mamma Mia cast. Take your pick, either one works. Um, And it's performed by the techies. I just, what can even be said that has not already been said about this performance? Like it is, Mm -hmm. it is quintessential ambition. It was kind of this, when I wrote this and I said, you know, like maybe I didn't do it justice, but like this is one of the most iconic performances in ambition history. Like I was right in 2019 Mm -hmm. and it still stays true to this day and it's just especially i think it was iconic at the time but when you look when you know what happens after and then you look back on it it's like even more you know yeah it's such it's such a touchstone i think it's like a touchstone ambition moment and i think you're right too looking back in the sense of like this idea of like I highlighted, you know, like Issa takes a brunt of the singing because given the talent level, most of the techies, this isn't, is that's for the best. It's like, we know that's not even necessarily true. Cause like mm. Dylan and Asher going to become big performers in the show. Lucas is not horrible. Like he has his moments and he has his little, little songs every now and yeah. then. Uh, Issa obviously is Issa. Uh, Dave is an instrumental boon to the a class he's always playing the guitar and like always playing the bagpipes um and then like you know nate and jeff are like i guess they're the like dancers of the group yeah like jeff especially yep like he's got his break dancing here and like that becomes very important later like i think the the truly quote-unquote least talented techies are like performing wise are jade like jade is 100 not a performer and mm-hmm. that's fine and then nate it's like, okay, so, like, we know that Emery can sing because, like, he was in a boy band and he can sing. But, like, I think Nate, the character, mm-hmm. is not a performer. Like, he can I feel like twerk. He's like a, he's like a stand-up comic kind of, you know, he has this, like, stage presence. But it's, like, yes, it's, like, not in a cool way where you're, like, wow, a performer. You're, like, I'm laughing. Like, <laughs> yeah. He probably tries to stand up comedy one day and is <laughs> booed off the stage, to be fair, because he's not actually funny. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, I wrote in my notes that I think if, you know, if we were actually in AA verse and filming this and whatever, I think Peyton would have a lot of fun with this um, mm-hmm. because he's so silly yeah. <laughs> and, like, getting to actually, like, perform quote unquote but like not seriously because this performance is not serious i just think he would find it fun based on like watching like he's all that and you know like all of the insane shit that he did in that movie like i think he would have had a blast with filming this totally and i think you can so imagine them doing like a little behind the scenes um interview for this because Mm -hmm. it's the big techie performance moment and you can imagine like Liam and Peyton kind of being interviewed and being like, yeah, it's it's like our turn. We're like the center, you know, we yeah. get to do these, doing this big performance. Um, we finally get to do that. And they're actually so excited to do it. Yeah. yeah. So cute. Yeah. And um, you know I, I love. Um, I love that Clarissa is, she puts the music on and she's like so happy and Chai is like, <laughs> she's working the lights. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, girl power like there's something about the females being the techies it's like it's very cool i'm i'm here for it i'm like (laughs) closet themselves and they should good for them yes let's go lesbians let's go lesbians um i love it i there's like a lot of little moments in this that i love like that's fun and like i love 
that like there it's it's explicitly said that like Nigel and Yindra have a moment with Jeff and Nate and it's like the Yindra and Jeff thing that like becomes a follow-up later on of like you know that's my straight husband um their whole thing I love Riley getting kisses from Dylan and Asher even though like they're not really friends yet but like just that like I know that's right yes Mm -hmm. I do um uh I you know I think it's just I want to see Jeff and Nate have to dance together because I think like all the other pairings make sense and that's like well now we're stuck together so I guess I'm gonna have to dance with Nate um (laughs) Issa like it is kind of it's like it works but it also doesn't because it's them you know yeah them dancing together it's just (laughs) Okay, yeah. On the one hand, it's like, well, they wouldn't dance with any of the others. But on the other hand, it's like, no. <laughs> That's weird. Yeah, it should be Lucas and Dave. <laughs> yeah. It's um. Good. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then I just love, like, of course, like, Dave and all of his, like, little little dance solos that he gets, which are super cute. Um, And then, I mean, of course, we have to talk about the wink. Of course. The iconic it's- wink. It's the elephant in the room right now. I mean, <laughs> people what? were killed when that like, happened. Honestly, left people, you know, de- decimated because. Yes. I mean, what? literally, when I remember when this episode came out and it had aired, you know, aired, quote unquote, um, <laughs> just so many of the reactions we got were people being like, the wink, like he winked. Yeah. What? Ah! and it was just like yeah. it is it is that moment it is that bitch so yeah very just i what truly what can you say about this number other than everything we just said it's iconic it's quintessential ambition mm-hmm. to me i think it's it's a perfect example of like the idea of ambition the show and it's its purpose and it's conceit as like joy ambition yeah. as joy because this number like is joyful in the show and it makes me feel joyful and I think when people remember this moment and when we talk about it as a fandom it's like it's it is just so joyful and I think that it plays into this kind of theme that ambition plays with of like music as this shared thing and art and performing being this kind of conduit for like human connection and, and being connected to people and being and feeling joy like I think that this is one of the perfect examples of that because it is just so so blatantly joyful from head to toe yeah like the end of the um performance when they're all just so happy and I feel like that um Lucas like pumping his fist in the air is like it's a visual Mm -hmm. um and then like and same with like just that whole like end where they're like jumping around yes everyone's so like everyone's applauding and it's it's so yeah like gen gift set of the a class Mm -hmm. yeah so sweet i love that um okay so never convey how iconic it is it's like just so you know guys like you don't even understand (laughs) i mean that's how i feel sometimes when i'm writing this i'm like i hope they get it because like this is a like even now like season four I'm like this is a moment and I hope people are like getting that this is a moment um, but I mostly trust you guys now at this point now that we're four seasons into this hellscape um so I trust that you guys know what's up um yeah so now we're speaking of beautiful things um have our last little Zay and Charlie scene here in this episode and First of all, let me just point out again, Charlie, once again, cleaning up after people. He needs to mm-hmm. stop doing that. He but that's okay. Um, but let me just say, like, this scene. So, obviously, it's, like, it's very nice because, like, you know, Charlie actually has a moment of being like, hey, actually, thanks for, like, sticking up for me. Like, that was really nice. It meant a lot. And Zay being like, oh, I do it any time. Like. And then kind of being like, I've actually had, like, a lot of fun this week, like, hanging out. Mm. Like, you know, we're, like I said, we're at that friend zone moment. He's crossed the friend zone. They're friends now. And it's like, okay, amazing. But all of that, like, this moment of, like, I actually had, like, a lot of fun this week. And, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, <laughs> It's, yeah. like, then the way that they have this exchange here of, like, I might take you up on that offer to hang out. And Charlie being, like, oh, like, hit me up. I'm sure we can work something out. Like, the vibes in this scene are egregious. They're so 
like low key flirtatious where it's not like outright like I'm flirting with you mm-hmm. but like mm-hmm. there's just the vibes are exactly. all over the place like they need to calm down <laughs> yeah because it's that's the thing is like we've talked about this before like Zay doesn't really like fully kind of comprehend he's like he's happy he's like oh yeah I made a friend like I kind of found this person who I get on with re- really really well with and mm-hmm. it's surprising but he doesn't kind of comprehend it as like this is like a future romance sort of thing yeah later and the fact that that he says it like that though where it's like yeah. I make you up on the offer to hang out sometime it's like you're what like you're basically like <laughs> flirting you're basically yes for that. yes yeah and you're exactly right like I think both of them again it's just like it's just the energy it's like I don't think they're intentionally trying to be like oh this is my moment to flirt but like it's just you know maybe this is gonna make me a bad ace because I'm like people can be friends if you know you don't no, it's never that you can't just be friends with someone. But to me, I'm like, listen, Zay and Charlie, obviously they were friends. And I think that that's very important. But like, have they ever really just been friends though? Like, I feel like mm. the vibes are always there and you can't, yeah. you can't ignore the vibes. Like, it's just there. That's just how they are with each other. It's just like, whew, man. I agree. And no, I get where you're coming from. Like, I don't think yeah. it makes you a bad ace or whatever. Like, it's like <laughs> I, I think it's that it's almost that thing that you can see because you're ace. Because it's like if people have vibes, like they have vibes, and I think people can pretend like it always happens in mm-hmm. rom coms and like sitcoms and everything. Like people are like, oh, like we were friends for so long. First, it's like, but there must have always been a vibe because otherwise, like, <laughs> what? That doesn't make sense. I mean, we can also, we could, if we want to get deeper into that, we can unpack that later with, like, Issa and Farkle and, like, mm-hmm. that debate there of, like, was there always vibes? But, but, um, but I don't know like, because they have this, they have the kind of more, like... They have a crazy arc. <laughs> yeah, I feel like their relationships with, like, identity are different. Mm-hmm. That, that, that kind of affects it. I mean, we can spend ages talking about this. But I feel like because of their, like, identities, like, gender identities and, like, relationships with who they're into, it, it kind mm-hmm. of doesn't work in the same way. Yeah, that's true. That's interesting. I, I'm, later I'm going to have to go back to this episode when I'm editing it and be like, okay, what were the, like, the five episodes that we said we should have at some yeah. point? <laughs> um, but that's another one. Um, but, yeah, I think, yeah, I think speaking from the ace perspective of when I think, when I write, you know, romance and I'm thinking about that and it's like that's something that you know I don't feel and I don't I've never experienced that myself but like this idea of like Zay and Charlie here it's like when there's romantic attraction and there's sexual attraction it's like you don't control that and it's like it's there even if you're not acknowledging it or don't realize it and I think that that's part of what this is is like both of them obviously I mean we know later it's like they they're into each other even if they don't consciously realize it yet so i think maybe that's just some of that kind of natural i'm i'm saying it this way because i want to say it this way but my brain doesn't realize you know like i think it's like the the pheromones (laughs) are speaking right now not the the brain (laughs) but yeah i am sure that charlie also must have been so proud of himself with his like hit me up I'm sure we can work something out like he walked out of the room he was like wow that was really cool of me to say that dude I sounded so cool uh-huh. he like how about that his ego <laughs> for the rest of the night and then the next day he woke up and he's like was I like being weird when I did that <laughs> he's <laughs> like why did I say that <laughs> but no it worked Charlie it worked don't worry so then we have this nice really nice moment between mm-hmm. Maya and Issa that I think is again a nice little kind of precursor to their friendship um because they're not quite they're definitely not friends here at this point but I think it's nice to show again a little more bias humanity and I just love this comparison that that they both do have of like weird parental relationships and how do you define Mm -hmm. yourself when your parents are kind of actually everybody in the show kind of has this to the degree like how do you define yourself when your parents have fucked you up like (laughs) so I think it's just a really interesting good foundational scene for the two of them yeah it's building something like they're not there's something like 
more than antagonism. Can't remember how how many conversations have they had the conversation where Maya saved her. Yes, which was not really a conversation. It was like Maya talking to Isa, who was not talking yeah. back. But yes. <laughs> So then this, so this is another performance. It's Free as a Bird, which I'm going to pronounce this name wrong, but I think it's Amelie Sande, um, which is like a... Amelie, isn't it? It could be. It could be. I've never, I've never said this person's name out loud. So, <laughs> um, but this is a, a it's, it did a little interesting story here is if you remember five million years ago, when this episode first came out, it was a different song. Um, it was a Sia song. I think oh. it was, I can't, even, I don't I can't, uh, it was um, Bird Set Free, or oh. whatever that song is by Sia. Um, so it was a different song. But when S and I were reflecting later in season, I think it was during during season three, um, Sia, you know, had her embarrassing moment. Like the same reason that we changed Titanium in mm. 105 and it became Carry On instead. It, to us, it was like, we don't need to change every single Sia song that has ever been in this show. But Issa singing a Sia song was a little bit like, mm, I don't know about that. So we went ahead and changed it and S pitched this song by this uh, smaller UK artist. And it's still like, is really, it's a really good song. Like it's really, I like the sweepingness of it. And it's a good, it's basically the same sentiment. So, you know, like it worked out well, but that's kind of the little uh, behind the scenes fun fact is if you remember the original, original episode, it was a different song and it's been retroactively changed. Damn, that was ages ago. I definitely yeah. don't remember that. I mean, I think I remember you talking about this. Doesn't even matter now because it's a million years ago. But we were like, you know what? It's fake TV and we can change anything we want at any time. So <laughs> we can change it. So we did. Then we have Jack confronting Marley, who was a student who was sending stuff out about Isa. And she, he basically is like, look, like this is a violation of privacy. And if you do anything else, I'm going to like have to expel your ass. And she's like... Well, it's really fucked up that, like, Lucas can beat someone up and not get expelled. Well, like, don't point out his hypocrisy, Marley, because Lucas is special. Um, But what she says is, like, listen, like, I'm sorry, like, I didn't mean to cause all this, but, like, I have information that you'd find interesting. So it's, like, continuing that kind of film noir, like, mystery plotline for Jack and Eric. They've got a new lead. Mm. Um, then we come into this last performance here. Farkle and Meyer are back at center stage and they're like, okay, so like, I guess we learned some stuff this week and just like Charlie said they would. Um, and <laughs> it's, it, it, Maya says this line, you know, like we lean on you guys all the time, usually without even realizing it. I think after this week, it'll be hard to forget how crucially. And I think that's a nice sentiment, but it's also very ironic because I feel like they do forget, like yeah. <laughs> they continue to be divas. Yeah. So I think like, it's just kind of funny that it's like she says that and then it's like, no, like definitely still in season two, especially. And then in season three, you guys have your moments of still being ridiculous. So baby steps, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's that's a thing is a lot of I guess that is just being like 14, 15 is like <laughs> 15 and 16. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes, totally. And then the next day you're like, mm, but like, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so good. So then we get into this last performance here, the closing episode performance, which is Lean On Me. And I went with the Glee cast because, again, one of the reasons I often choose Glee cast performances is because it sounds like young people singing, um, which is what we want. Um, again, a cute, it's just cute. It's fun. Um, I like that it's the techies and the performers coming together. I like that we get Issa with the other main performers. Like, I think the way I kind of, it's interesting because I think the way I visualize mm -hmm. that moment is you have Zay, Farkle, Maya, Riley, Issa right at the front there. So it's it's interesting because you're like, oh, that's the mains. But then st even still, like Charlie and Lucas are not included in that. Obviously Lucas for obvious reasons, but like this idea of Charlie really not being seen as a main character until later, I think is just an interesting thing about his presence and purpose in the storyline yeah. but yeah that's that's interesting and i love everybody dancing together and one moment that i really love another kind of like visual thing for me is the moment with dylan and asher like swaying lucas and like having their arms around him like that is a a Luke asher visual that 
again, if I was going to make a gen, gen gift set for the three of them, that would always be in it. Because it's just, like, so... It's such a them thing for me. Yeah. People who can loosen Lucas up. And, like, those moments are just really important. Mm-hmm. And I love, too, the moment of Sean and Angela, like, watching it together. It's cute. It's cute. They were cute. I was really obsessed with them. This is a, you know, it's a very cute episode for them, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's not deep. It's just a... Yeah. yeah. For now, as the last line of the episode says. (laughs) (laughs) And that's it. That's the end of the episode. So, (laughs) here we are. We made it. Did you have a favorite character this episode? Yes. I feel like it's already come across, but my favorite character is Lucas in this episode. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's time to shine, but he's not shining because he's dirty. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Um, that's good. Uh, my favorite characters for this episode, I too, were Maya, because again, mm-hmm. I loved kind of all of her strange small moments of humanity in a time when you would expect her not to have humanity. You'd expect her to be... Yeah the Farkle kind of and be the diva about everything but she's not um and I really like that and then Charlie was my other favorite because I think he had you know so many again like the teaching thing and just being so so good and so baby (laughs) this episode it was just like a good one for him so and he's about to have a like a really hard time next episode so pour one out for him uh how about fave performances Faith performance, it's a, it's a, actually an interesting one put four performances because I feel like a lot of the real ones where it's like someone actually singing. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's a lot of ensemble and, ones, again, and, like we were talking yeah, about. A lot doesn't, I think, because the waltz is not a performance, but mm-hmm. I love that. And same with um, the montage. Mm-hmm. Um what is it called? Strangers. Strangers like me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but obviously the best one is Dancing Queen because it is <laughs> just so iconic. Um, I think the more you reread season one and like the further you get into the other seasons, the more iconic it becomes. Mm-hmm. Um, some, yeah, some, I agree. Um, like, I think some performances were iconic at the time and then it's not like they lose that, but they don't gain anything from like Mm -hmm. the next stuff but i think that one really does um for some yeah totally that is so interesting do you have like one off the top of your head that you think is was iconic at the time but is like kind of it it stays in that world (laughs) i think a lot of the first few episodes Mm -hmm. um, yeah like a lot of the first ones that especially the solo ones that like farkle and things do like at the time it was like oh my gosh like yeah, so good. They're singing like Wicked or they're singing mm-hmm. like songs. But then it's kind of like in the end, that was just another song at that time. It definitely makes more of an impact when it's a, a group because yeah. the dynamics improve over time. So true. We'll have to keep that in mind as we move forward. If there's anyone that jumps out where we're like, oh, like this was a in the moment iconic versus long time iconic. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that also makes me think, again, I'm, like, taking notes for myself on the podcast. I'm making everybody listen to my planning ideas. Um, <laughs> we should um, definitely, when we do our season one recap and then, you know, obviously moving forward, we should kind of do, like, looking back, like, what do we think are the quintessential ambition performances from that season? Yeah. And then we can have, like, a little list of, like, Maddie and Maggie's, like, quintessential ambition performances. Yes, yeah, so cute. I love it. So yeah, okay, last question for me here. Well, I have two because we have to talk about rankings, but favorite scenes. Did you have favorite scenes? Uh, I mean, you know, I love this episode. Um, mm-hmm. It's just a really solid episode for season one and so many good scenes. So many good mm-hmm. Holly and Zay scenes. So many good Riley and Lucas scenes. Um, I think my favorite is... Oh, I can't decide. Just... Okay, the waltz and the lighting booth, Riley and Lucas scenes. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think, as we said earlier, I was inspired to draw those moments, which yes, 
is quite a big deal. Yes, 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 yes. For me, um, I would say kind of obvious, obviously Riley Lucas and their dancing scene, very quintessential. Um, the ZC costume loft scene mm-hmm. is a top one for me. Um, I also had the Strangers Like Me sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, not because, like, not necessarily as the performance, but like all the little beats that were in that <laughs> sequence. Yeah. Um, and then also the opening cafeteria scene with all of the little dynamics and funny digs and stuff like that, I think is just really yeah, fun. So that's a great one. So then the last question is what, where does this fall out of 40, 41, 41 episodes, right? Yeah. 41, 42. I think it's 41. Let me see what I wrote in my last episode. Cause I wrote it down. Me flipping all my pages. Yes. 41. Okay. So. Out of 41, where does this episode land for you? Um, let me check my little list here. It's gonna be like embarrassingly low. No, it's number 18. Okay, so within the within the top 50%. Yeah. The, the 50th percentile, right? Or something. <laughs> How about you? You're gonna <laughs> be like Maggie, what the fuck? Um, because you love this episode. For me, it's 29 out of 41. Wow. I mean, but um, I, think, I feel like my 29, you would say the same thing. And I feel like that <laughs> middle area is kind of like, these are all good episodes. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I don't I don't have any problem with this episode. I think it's really fun. I think it has important moments. I think it's great. But it's like, when the, it's hard when, you know, like when there's other episodes that are like equally as good, it just, it comes down to like kind of the little things of like, what do you just, what really stood out to you? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to be interesting as we um, go forward and rank these because who's, who's to say? I mean, maybe at the end of our podcast, we will have different opinions. Yeah, I mean, that's true. When the, when the full show is done and all the episodes are out there, it could move around even more. Things could totally flip. We don't know. When, you, when you've seen the end, you look back with hindsight gonna be crazy it's 2020 <laughs> 2022 so with that um that kind of wraps it up um we hopefully will get better about recording these again and also hopefully i will like actually edit it so we can actually post them and peer people can hear these um but we're coming back to you soon as always if you have any questions for the podcast you can send them to the ambition tumblr or our instagram you can dm us um or eventually our website's also going to be up but also at the same time i think we talked about this a little bit on the instagram but we are planning to potentially maybe possibly likely um create a ambition discord officially for the fandom community and i was already planning to have a little space channel for this podcast and also emma and hanny's podcast so once that's up if you decide to join and come be goobs with us full-time in ambition land Mm -hmm. uh you can also send questions there so that will soon be an option as well so yeah that's what i got from me uh what say you maddie i say no see you always stump me with this because i never like prepare (laughs) i need to start preparing something cute (laughs) Um, it's like i've done this eight times now you should be ready for it (laughs) i just i'm never ready um (laughs) hanging out with us today everyone i always want to do like a quote Mm, that'd be fun. Do it in advance. Um, <laughs> da, da, da. That's like, I've started doing that um, on my Discord. My status is always a quote from the upcoming episode that I'm currently writing. Oh. Um, so if we if we end up in a Discord together, you all would be able to see that. But I will share today's for upcoming 403. My status is a true diva always knows when to delegate. Hmm. I will say I am not simply limited to the senatorial art. <laughs> Damn right you aren't. <laughs> so much more. All right. With that, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you all next time. Bye. Bye.